Thanks everyone for joining us. This is uh, webinar number three in our series on radon information for HUD grantees. And um, so we're gonna get going in today's webinar. Next slide. Um, so this is the uh, webinar number three in a series of three. So if you've made it to one and two, thank you. And um, if for any reason you didn't make it to number one or two, uh, we are setting up a, uh, a HUD website where these are going to um, be archived for future viewing, or you can return to them. So today's topics, um, we're going to um, have a little bit of a re-review of some of the basics we uh, had in webinar one and two. And then um, Dave uh, Kaptorowski is going to talk about also new construction. Um, and then uh, second after that, uh, Jane Malone is gonna talk about some of the policies uh, framework on radon, talk about certification, finding a qualified professional and some of the uh, state regulations that are out there. So a little bit of housekeeping, just like the other webinars, uh, we're gonna use the chat feature. If you have sort of like technical questions or, um, you need something, and then we're going to use the Q&A feature for questions. We're going to um, then collect those at the end, and, um, and I can ask the presenters those questions at the end. Some of them, if we can answer them in the Q&A chat, we'll do so right there. Um, and those will also be available once we post them on the website. So here's just uh, some of the contacts. Um, I'm Justin Gray. I'm in the Office of Public Housing at HUD. Uh, my colleague in Healthy Homes, Peter Ashley, um, is not on this webinar today, but is another resource uh, that I work with on uh, radon guidance. And then we have two great speakers today. Uh, both are um, uh, from ARST, and then Dave also has uh, his own company. So Dave Kaptorowski um, goes by Dave K. He, um, he's got a lot of practical uh, experience in both measurement testing and mitigation that he's going to share. And then Jane Malone um, has a depth of policy experience on radon um, that she can share with you as well. So I look forward to a really good webinar. And the first one is going to be Dave. OK, thank you, Justin. Can you see my screen? Looks good. OK, thank you. Let's get started. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about a little bit about uh, radon and new construction, and specifically what type of preparation work uh, you can do during the uh, new construction process to ensure success in dealing with a potential radon problem. Uh, just a quick review, radon, you can't see it, smell it, or taste it, uh, but it's a naturally occurring radioactive gas that's known to cause cancer in humans. Uh, the primary health concern with radon is that it does lead to lung cancer and is responsible for uh, over 21,000 deaths a year. And that's a, an acute uh, accumulation of a lifetime of exposure to, um, to radon. It depends upon the radon concentrations and the amount of time that's uh, spent uh, in those concentrations. So if, in order to have a, a radon problem, you need to have a radon source, you need to have a driving force, something to move it. Uh, rocks don't generally move around in the soil too much, but uh, as a gas, radon uh, is capable of moving around if it has a driving force. And there's a preferential pathway that can get that inside uh, the structure. So the number one source for radon is the soil. Um, there are other sources of radon. You can get radon from water uh, and you can get radon from building materials itself. But in terms of radon in soil, it depends upon the amount of radium that, uh, and that content that's in the soil and really um, how the porosity and um, the size of the soil particles, in other words, how easily can the radon move around inside the soil. Now, everyone wants to have a magic bullet that says, well, 
why do I, let's figure out ahead of time whether I have a radon problem or a potential for a radon problem before I start building. Uh, and that's not something that we have a reliable way to, to measure, uh, especially when you're dealing with large sites uh, and you can have concentrated um, <coughs> sources that are uh, speckled throughout the site. Uh, but to be fair, um, we, there are people who actually do uranium mining out in the desert uh, and they will go out and drill holes on a grid work and drop in radon test kits uh, and come back some period of time. And based on that, they can figure out where there might be uranium buried and where someplace that uh, uh, they shouldn't bother doing any, any uh, excavating or mining. The driving forces that typically uh, move radon are in fact caused by the structure. Um, diffusion will move whether there's a structure or, or not. If it's just uh, open to atmosphere, you can still see radon movement through diffusion, but uh, things like exhaust ventilation, uh, thermal bypasses, which are just uh, the way a, a structure is built so that there are gaps in between floors and it allows uh, air movement, which can bring so gas along with it. But the strongest one uh, has to do <coughs> with um, stack effect that can either be caused by uh, internal heating uh, during the winter or solar heating that occurs uh, on a structure. But uh, hot air rises uh, and that hot air will find its way out of the building uh, and then it will need to, to be replaced. And some of the amount of air that is replaced is going to come from the soil. Um, in terms of pathways, well, uh, we can be uh, pretty efficient of actually building those in. They may not exist until we go through the construction process and we bring in utilities and we pour our foundation walls and we dig trenches uh, and all that type of thing. So without a uh, a structure in place, some of those pathways uh, may not be obvious. And that all leads to the, the difficulty in trying to identify whether one particular lot may or may not have a radon potential. We'll spend some time here talking about uh, a couple of ANSI ARST standards, which are related to uh, new construction. And the first is the ANSI ARCH CCAH. Uh, and this is a model code for uh, one and two family dwellings and townhouses and essentially provides radon control means that make it um, more efficient and more effective to deal with the radon problem uh, through active soil depressurization if after the building is completed, testing is performed and you find out that you have a radon issue. CC1000, I'm sorry, that's a typo. It's not CC100, it's CC1000. Um, that's intended for larger buildings. So anything larger than the, the one and two family structures that are covered in uh, CCAH. The significance of standards use. Um, these standards are uh, intended to uh, be able to provide the means so that you can mitigate uh, soil gas entry into a structure. But they also provide a means so that a qualified person can inspect uh, that system and know that it's being installed properly. Uh, a lot of these features uh, as, as the building progresses will get hidden uh, inside uh, walls, structures uh, and such and so uh, you'll need to do uh, some inspection as it moves along to know that things are being done properly. Um, and the codes, uh, both of these codes are intended to be uh, adoptable uh, by local jurisdictions uh, for uh, building code use uh, in that particular area. Now, every structure has six sides. You have a roof, you have four sides, and then you have the bottom, which is generally the, the foundation. Um, as we build more and more energy efficient structures we, structures, we spend a lot of time tightening up the top five sides 
of a building envelope. Um, but it's the sick side which touches the soil that can often be neglected and that can lead to a greater soil gas entry and eventually to uh, a more significant radon issue. So what's covered in the standards, uh, the rough end features for radon control, um, you can see here on the left, um, what we're looking to do is put elements in place to that can be used for an active soil depressurization system, but to put those in place while the walls are still open. Uh, and this is not only the, the least costly um, way to do this installation, but it's also uh, the, can be the most effective and have the longest service life because none of this piping uh, gets exposed to outside weather. Uh, you generally have to, don't have to deal with a lot of issues like icing uh, and such, which could be if you had 30 feet of pipe um, that was exposed um, to a cold climate. But so it involves running pipe from uh, a basement, a crawl space, or whatever your foundation type is. The, the pipe is run up through the structure. Um, there's provision, there's a cylindrical space defined um, that is 21 inches uh, in diameter and about three feet high to give access so that if you needed to cut in a fan for activation, that room is available. Don't install the pipe down here in the eave where you can't get at it and access it. That just becomes something that has to get cut out and is not suitable for uh, an ASD system. Uh, and it also provides a means to have uh, an electrical box within six feet uh, of where the fan would get uh, mounted. So within that cylindrical space within six feet so that you have a plug in cord. Now there are different <coughs> types of connections uh, depending upon the foundation type and really depending upon what uh, part of the, the country or part of the world um, you're building in. Uh, a gravel base uh, in most parts of the country uh, can be used to provide a, a gas permeable layer, uh, it tends to be relatively inexpensive. Uh, other parts of the country, gravel is a very expensive option. And so then we look at things like geotextile materials to get placed uh, underneath that concrete slab. So uh, egg crates that are covered with a, a cloth material to provide the gap so that you can have airflow uh, underneath that space. And if you're dealing with the crawl space, then you may have uh, a membrane, which would be this soil gas retarder um, and a, a different mound means of uh, connecting that up to pipe underneath that membrane. <laughs> but what we're trying to um, create is a gas collection plenum. And so this would be, if, if uh, this were a full basement foundation, then these would be the walls of the foundation coming up here on the side and a concrete floor that gets poured. Uh, we create a gas permeable layer underneath that. And so this allows any radon gas that comes up from the soil to get collected inside that gas permeable layer. And if it's connected to an active soil depressurization system, then it can be vented out. Now, if you're dealing with um, either some soils that where you cannot support uh, the, uh, the structure simply by a perimeter foundation, such as if you're dealing with uh, the red clays of Georgia where every interior wall must run to a, a, a grade beam uh, on the foundation. Or here, this appears to be for a, uh, a much larger structure. Um, <clears throat> these grade beams uh, have to be interconnected and you see holes that are, are deliberately built into the, the grade beams uh, to avoid having to have a spaghetti of pipes that would be run uh, above the slab. So this uh, is a way of interconnecting them so that the gas 
can flow through from cell to cell uh, as it's created by these grade beams. The actual pipe connection uh, depends upon the foundation type. Um, this is an example where uh, you just have a, a pit structure and that's dug out of the gravel and you can connect the pipe up to that. It can connect up to a, uh, a sump basin, although that's generally not recommended because you can have uh, service issues with, with that, meaning uh, if this is here to deal with groundwater and you have to disconnect your radon system to get at your sump pump, uh, that can lead to issues, but it is a, a possibility. Uh, drain tile uh, can be used in, in some structures in either an internal loop of drain tile or an external loop uh, of drain tile, and you can connect the pipe up to that. That would serve as your gas permeable layer. Uh, over here we see um, this would be a crawl space uh, and you need to cover over the open soil with a membrane uh, and perforated pipe underneath that membrane would serve as your uh, soil gas collector. Uh, <clears throat> this is for hollow blocks, uh, hollow blocks themselves, the cavities there can provide uh, a soil gas uh, collection and so that can be used as a suction point sometimes. Typically you want to run your pipe so that it's a, a one foot above the roof surface. Um, this keeps the pipe on the interior of the structure. Uh, if you're dealing with multi um, multi-floor buildings that get up to uh, 75 feet in height. There are exceptions that would allow you to take the pipe uh, to a minimum distance of 30 feet and exhaust there. Uh, and what you're really trying to do is uh, exhaust the gas, the radon gas in such a place such that you don't have um, the likelihood that it would get re-entrained back into the building. And so there are rules, as you see here, you have to be a certain distance above windows, you have to be a certain distance away from windows. Uh, if you have patios, balconies, decks, those types of things, um, the standards all have rules as to uh, how close you can be uh, to uh, have the willows where those exhaust vent locations uh, can be placed. Ceiling is always uh, important to close off radon entry points, but also if it's the system is going to be activated, um, you don't want to lose a lot of conditioned air uh, getting pulled down through the crack that may exist between a, a poured concrete floor uh, and a poured foundation wall. Um, here in, in plumbing, uh, quite often there are hammer ins so that they don't know exactly where this bathtub is going to go. So they get close and they leave a big open box uh, in the concrete floor. Uh, and that could be a tremendous soil gas entry. And so that would need to get closed off before the, the walls get closed off. And if you have a water drainage system, a, a sump drain, such as you see here, a sump basin, um, that should be closed. Uh, testing, the, uh, the standards have various um, requirements for testing. If you're looking at CCAH, uh, there is a test requirement. Uh, and to do that, that, so we're talking there, one, one or two family homes and townhouses, uh, any one of these devices uh, could be used to provide a, uh, a radon test. They would be, um, it, with the exception of, of AlphaTrack, which is a long-term test, it requires 90, a minimum of 90 days to execute a test. All other tests are done a minimum of two days. And so they're placed in the environment for two days 
and then they're either read on site. If you have an electronic continuous monitor, you can get a result immediately, or it could be sent back to the laboratory uh, and the laboratory can pro provide a, a test result. So this might be a, a typical test report. Here you see uh, someone has a, a radon problem because the EPA action level is four picocuries per liter uh, as a measure of radioactivity per volume. Um, so a liter, you think of a, a two liter bottle of, of Coke, okay, half of that is a, is a liter. So a certain amount of radioactivity in that volume. Um, and when it's at four picocuries, that's where the EPA recommends that uh, it be reduced. The World Health Organization actually has a reference level, which is slightly lower at 2.7 picocuries per liter. Um, but the EPA does provide a recommendation that if your testing comes in between two and four, you might want to think about um, fixing that. Uh, here a 12.2 would clearly be uh, above the, the 4.0 EPA action level. If you're dealing with CC1000 in a large building, um, there is pressure field extension testing, which is performed. Um, and the intent of this is not to determine whether you have uh, a radon problem or not, but it is to determine whether in fact, um, if an active soil depressurization system was installed on this large complicated slab structure, um, that there is communication to all areas uh, of the slab. And so this type of testing is done. There would be a fan or, or some kind of a, a vacuum source that gets applied um, to a hole through the slab and then measurements are made to determine at all these test points whether that influence can be seen. So whatever is creating vacuum underneath the slab, all of those test points are measured uh, and that gives you an assurance that if it needs to be activated for active soil depressurization that uh, you do have connectivity and it should work uh, well. We talked about active soil depressurization, uh, ASD, that is the, uh, the best available technology for dealing with radon removal. Uh, it can be up to 99% uh, effective in removing radon. Uh, you can never get air inside a structure cleaner than outdoor air. Um, but what ASD tries to do is that because the, the house or the structure is under negative pressure, it tries to create a greater, greater negative pressure underneath the structure and harvest up any radon that's available in that soil so that it can be removed up through the piping system and out. So if you um, do the steps that are uh, shown for the rough in uh, of an ASD sim system and you do your testing and find out that you have a, um, an elevated radon issue, then what you would be looking at would be installing a radon fan. Um, typically the locations for uh, the radon fan, they want to be in a place so that if there's a leakage, it's doesn't leak into the living space. And if you're dealing with new construction, then there would be a, um, either a, a, an attic uh, space or a garage loft, um, but it could be mounted uh, outside. If we were dealing with taller structures, um, then that piping may run up 30 feet or more and the fan could be located outside. But the intent is keep it away from the uh, interior living space so that uh, you don't create a, a problem that's worse that existed before the fan was installed. Uh, just to review the components of a, an ASD system. So you have a soil gas collection plenum that's constructed on the bottom. 
uh, of the structure. The details of that will depend upon what the foundation looks like. Uh, they're all multiple uh, variations are provided uh, in the, the standards um, to tell you how to make that connection, um, depending upon what the foundation type is, but then there's system piping that will run up to a fan uh, and then it's exhausted uh, above the roof of the structure. Uh, other visible aspects of an ASD system, it should be adequately labeled so that it's identified as to what its purpose is. Um, it should, you should have information as to who was the contractor that installed it, as well as telling the occupants uh, not to tamper with or, or disconnect um, any part of the system. Uh, an audible alarm and a pressure gauge uh, are re required by the standards. Uh, the pressure gauge gives you an indication as to what the vacuum pressure is that the, the fan is operating at. Um, but that doesn't have a lot of meaning to homeowners. And so the audible alarm, uh, if that pressure were to uh, go away or change significantly, it will provide a uh, an audible alarm for the occupants to let them know that there's a uh, problem with the system. If you have uh, installed the ASD system, meaning that you had to activate uh, and install a fan, you want to wait a minimum of 24 hours uh, before testing just to give an opportunity for the system to, uh, to clear the radon out before you evaluate um, how effective uh, that's working for you. And documentation, uh, very important to describe the, the system, um, give information about the contractor and along with a uh, recommendation for retesting uh, every couple of years. Um, and that's it, this is uh, my contact information. Um, the standards, Dot ars dot org. Uh, all the standards that I spoke about here, along with all of the ARS ANSI standards are available that you can view as a flip book. So if you want to look at some of the details there, you can go to that location. If you want to locate um, professionals, uh, Jane will get into this uh, much more significantly, but these are, are two websites where you can find uh, radon professionals that are trained to, uh, to deal with uh, either a, a retrofit system or new construction as we were discussing here today. So that's all that I have. I'm going to stop sharing and pass it over to you, Jane. Hi, thank you. Thanks, Steve. And um, let me just get my slides up here on my sec. Well, um, so I'm the final speaker, um, except during questions and answers in this uh, series. And I hope it's been beneficial to everyone who's participating. Thank you for hanging in. I know we're, we're delivering a lot of information and hopefully you're gonna find all of it useful. Um, and so just as a reminder, I am Jane Malone and I'm the National Policy Director for the American Association of Radon Scientists and Technologists. And uh, for those of you who don't know us, ARS is a nonprofit professional organization of members who are dedicated to the highest standard of excellence and the ethical performance of radon measurement, mitigation, and transfer of information for the benefit of members, consumers, and the public at large. And so I'm going to try to wrap things up here, um, talking about you know, what, is the, what are the policies that really tie all this together, or in some cases don't, um, across the country and, and in different places. So over the overview here, radon policy framework, um, the United States Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, is a key player, um, had significant congressional mandates starting in the late 1980s. And they define what I'm calling the technical parameters for the work that we do. They establish the radon action level, um, which has been talked about several times with four picocuries per liter of air. They maintain a national radon reference, which really underscores and um, he keeps level, uh, a reference point where everyone can check their radon measurement against this national radon reference. 
Um, the EPA also recognizes proficiency programs, NRPP and NRSB, and I'm going to talk about those in a couple minutes. They uh, recommend standards. They had a history with standards before this time, but at this point, they're recommending national consensus standards. And they perform research on risk and provide a, very, a variety of public information services pertaining to radon. Other federal agencies define and determine the requirements for properties under their care and control. Obviously, HUD does that, and you've got several different approaches within HUD. The US Department of Defense, um, I think all four of the branches, I know Navy, Army, and the Marine Corps each have radon policies. USDA and the Veterans of Federal Affairs have, um, that's not the part, but they, they both of those agencies all have um, requirements for um, single family uh, testing, um, recommendations for testing upon um, transfer. And then 20 states regulate radon work in one way or another, and we're gonna take a closer look at that here. So first of all, radon professionals and credentials, private certifications and state requirements are the two overlapping frameworks that um, affect who is qualified to do this work. First of all, the private radon proficiency programs in Congress. The Congress uh, authorized EPA to oversee proficiency and they did that for a few years, but discontinued their program in 1999. Um, and in 2001, they recognized two private proficiency programs, which are to this day, the only EPA recognized proficiency programs. National Radon Safety Board and National Radon Proficiency Program. And I should note that NRPP is run by a certification council, but it's managed by my organization, the American Association of Radon Scientists and Technologists. EPA is evaluating stronger criteria for its recognition of private proficiency programs. Um, they're seeking to promote greater uniformity between the two programs and across the country. Um, and um, they're also, that will, in, in turn, they will make a new round of recognition decisions which could um, add or subtract uh, the, the, to the list of, of programs they now recognize. And I should caution you that there are a couple of programs out there that say that they deliver training and qualifications and so on, but they're not EPA recognized. You wanna be careful to stay in the realm of the ones that EPA has recognized, which are national and have long track records. Um, and EPA is also looking at those criteria for programs across the country um, having consistency specifically with regard to standards. And we'll be talking about standards in a couple of minutes. So the key focus of proficiency programs are to certify qualified personnel based on training and examination to basically decide who, who gets a credential to do this work. And um, in many cases, people don't make it through that process or the testing um, the first time through. Um, uh, and we'll talk about the, that in a minute. But investing, um, they also investigate and resolve complaints and they play a role, you know, regardless of where um, the, the person is doing the work in the country, whether it's a, a regulated state or not, the proficiency programs have a duty to investigate and resolve complaints about the work of the individuals operating under their programs. And they also review and approve training courses, tests or examinations, um, devices and labs and standards. States also have a role in regulating radon mitigation and measurement. There are 20 states that um, oversee any, any of that work now. Um, two of them, I should add, New Hampshire and Utah only oversee mitigation work, not measurement. The key element of the state radon programs, um, this credential program, in my opinion, is that they have the authority to prohibit performance of radon work in their states by persons who aren't qualified. They specify the required credentials for performing works in, in three different ways. Some of them only require a private proficiency certification, meaning there's no state provided credential. 11 of them have only a state license. They're not involved with the proficiency programs at all, but there's a state program um, involving, you know, tests and examinations and, you know, specific state requirements and so on. And there's four states that do both, that have both a certification requirement, you must be certified by one of the private proficiency programs, and you must also possess a state license, but you can't get that state license unless you have that private proficiency certification. Um, and they also have been involved in lab and device approvals along with the private programs. Um, so as I've mentioned, 30 states, the other 30 states, uh, Washington DC, Puerto Rico, and the territories do not regulate radon, radon work. So here's a national map. You can find your state here. 
Um, and the purple states are the ones with no credential. The green states require certification or certification leading to a license. And the blue colored states are license only. And this information will be provided in a table that we'll see in a couple of minutes. So overall, just here's the universe of credentialed radon professionals in the US at this point. And the left two bars are measurement. Um, the blue is privately certified and the red is state license. Between those two types of credentials, we have around 6,400 measurement professionals in the US. The right two columns or bars are the mitigation professionals. And between those two, between the private on the left and the state licensed on the right, we have around 1,800 um, credentialed measurement, excuse me, mitigation professionals in the US. So selecting a radon measure professional, I actually copied this text directly from one of our standards, the, the MIMF standard. The goal is to select a radon profession, measure professional who provide reliable services and procedures. You should use experienced professionals who have demonstrated a minimum degree of technical knowledge and that is sufficient to replace, re retrieve, and analyze radon detection devices and to design, plan, and implement quality procedures when conducting radon measurements. All equipment used for measuring radon must meet the requirements of the local jurisdiction or state jurisdiction or be listed by a nationally recognized proficiency program if the jurisdiction has no device verification program. So that's guidance from the measurement standard for Moly Family. Locating qualified radon professionals, um, there's a map at this uh, URL, epa.gov slash radon, for if you know you're in a licensed state and you're looking to start with the state, license, the state licensing program. And on this slide, we have images of the two um, website lookup functions for the two proficiency programs. NRSB is on the left, and you can see their very first tab choice is to sort by state. And you can also sort by zip code on both of these sites and you'll get uh, a list back showing you by distance from that zip code, a list of the various professionals. Um, and of course you can, you're, you're searching also by certification or credential type on both sides. Um, and th th this right-hand site, NRPP site has a drop-down menu for the type of radon professional at the top. And then that leads to the, you're selecting a state, I'm sorry. Um, so that's it for the credentialing for the moment. And now we're gonna move into the radon standards. So the NCRS radon standards, which you've heard a lot about in the past uh, two and a half webinars, um, the reason why you've heard so much is they are actually the only national current consensus standards. They're developed and maintained by stakeholders and the stakeholders include practitioners, federal and state agency staff and consumer interests. Um, these standards are recognized by HUD, FHA, and most regulatory states. They are recommended by EPA, as I mentioned earlier, um, and then you can view them for free. All these standards are posted for free at this website, https slash standards.rs.org. Um, we live in a world where the standards organizations you know, historically pay their bills by selling standards, but most um, professional organizations have made a determination that sharing free viewing of those standards is critical to getting those standards adopted and used. And so like others, the ANSI, um, the Ars Consortium of Radon Standards lets you see their, their standards on that website. It's a big picture. How does the Ars Consortium of National Radon Standards fit into the world of standards? The middle of this graphic, you can see the International Organization for Standardization or ISO and it is worldwide. Um, ANSI is the American National Standards Institute partner in ISO. It's part of the ISO and all uh, and hundreds of standards organizations along that bottom bar are part of the ANSI family, including the ARS Consortium, ASHRAE, ASTM. There are a number of organizations involved in the ANSI. So that's where the ANSI ARS comes from, the American National Standards Institute. And ANSI has requirements that are um, upheld through their accreditation decisions and their ongoing audits of the standards organizations that they um, have recognized. The criteria on this list include openness, lack of dominance by any particular party or type of party or individual or business, balance um, in terms of the participation in standards process, coordination and harmonization, between standards and across standards organizations so that there's 
generally, you know, consistency or an explanation for inconsistency, why something might not be um, coordinated as it should be. Notification of standards development is a key part of the process to be as others do. Um, the ARS consortium announces when it's considering work, you know, a new standard or it's making significant revisions. And this is all part of the ANSI process. There's a check and balance to ensure that there's possible um, consideration of views and objections by parties who are not involved in the standards process. Um, all decisions are made by a consensus vote. There can be appeals. There are written procedures covering all of the above. And ba basically all those of us who participate in the ANSI process must comply with these normative ANSI policies and administrative procedures. And they really help to make the standards stronger. The ARS consortium itself, um, how it achieves balance it, first of all, the representation occurs on both the oversight and the working committees. And this long list of entities you can see here, it's educators, regulated states, non-regulated state certification programs, EPA, HUD, public health, home inspectors, testing professionals, mitigation professionals, laboratory scientists, radon chambers, due diligence, builders, vapor intrusion. These are all stakeholders involved in, some standards don't involve all these parties, it depends on the subject matter, but it, the, the effort is to make sure that all these parties that have something to contribute will be in fact sitting on the working committee for each standard. And then this is the overview. Again, you heard about these standards one by one. This is just a quick overview. The rows are, um, the, the column heading, sorry, are one and two family schools, other large schools in the multifamily. The first row is mitigation standards. You just, and read on measurement is the second pair of rows and new construction is the third. And this is just an overview of how, how it all fits together that we've really covered the basis within the consortium to address all levels of work and all types of buildings. So what's the context here? Well, there are older radon standards out there. EPA protocols, which were written in the 1990s, have been archived by EPA. The reason why they've been archived is because there, are no pro there is no process for updating them. And EPA believes that the NCR standards have succeeded in replacing those old EPA protocols. Nonetheless, some states still use one or two of these and the states listed there on the slide. Um, and the, the, the part of the reason for that is, you know, in order to have public policy at the state level, something needs to be written down in either a regulation or a law. And so it takes a while to, as progress gets made in terms of new standards coming online, for these states to get, go through the process of deciding to update their standards and then um, actually accomplishing the, the enactment of that policy decision. The American Society of Testing and Materials, or ASTM, has had two standards on radon over the years. Uh, one of them is on single family mitigation and the other is on single family new home construction. Both of those standards are expired. There is a conversation about reviving this E21 one, um, and that's, that conversation is pending. But at present, these two standards are, um, they, they've not been maintained. They're not actually reflecting current knowledge and, you know, from the field and in practice. Um, finally, some states adopted their own standards. Um, some of this happened before EPA uh, put out any protocols. Some states felt that they could just write a better protocol than anybody else could. Various reasons why these states needed to have something on the books for um, that the, the came to be their own individual standards. And so that list is there, you can see that. So here's the overview of um, standards and, um, and certification credentialing requirements, what's in place by and the, the first column, it's only those 20 states that regulate anything that are reflected on this table. So you see variation. You've got some states that have both certification licenses I mentioned earlier. Over on the standard side, um, you can see we've got a few states where there's rulemaking underway, but the, and they're considering adopting the NCR standards. This last column is those exceptions I was discussing on the previous uh, slide, where a state has one or more standards in use that's not part of this EPA recommended group of standards. Now I'm gonna talk about best practices, um, a few key things here. And um, first of all, I wanted to mention the HUD FHA um, multifamily program. Um, this program, which started in 2013, um, affects properties that are currently receiving a loan that's overseen by the HUD FHA program. 
So these are existing buildings for the most part, but they're buildings that are undergoing some kind of financing or sale, um, and therefore a decision can be made in the loan process. And the HUD FHA multifamily program requires adherence to the current NCR standards, which includes testing each ground contact unit. Mitigation, if anywhere in the building is above the EPA action level, and an operation maintenance plan, which requires testing after two to five or five years. The HUD multifamily program also requires um, private proficiency certifications, and that's a national requirement because those programs are national. Um, in addition, if there is a state licensing program, the individuals working in those states must also possess the state license. There's no exemption in the HUD FHA program by radon zone, and they also do require radon system and new construction as previously described by Dave. Um, another practice um, of, of importance in the radon field is, um, is the percentage of ground contact, contact unit test, testing. This has come up because there's been variation in approaches to how many units need to be tested. The Earth study was um, started in 2017 and it's recently completed. Journal article um, published June 21 is here on this slide. And there's also a little bit of information at this URL on our website. Um, so this is the Earth study. I'm gonna start with the conclusions. Usually people build up and, and tell, you, tell you how they got there and then what they decided. This was a three-year study to determine whether 2017 federal radon testing protocols were insufficient to effectively safeguard occupants. occupants. The study included 687 buildings, nearly 8,000 residential units. For all building size, um, two to 3% um, would still not be identified when 90% of the units are measured, meaning even if you test 90% of the units in a building, you have a two or 3% possibility of missing a unit with high radon. The study investigators concluded that federal radon testing protocols in effect in 2017 for multifamily buildings are inadequate to identify units containing above four deeper periods of radon. So this is, although it's a mathematical graph, it reflects a development. This looks, this is a seven building development and each of the buildings has seven units. And the story this slide tells is that um, if you only test 25% of the units, sorry, in such a building, um, what would you get what did you get in, under, in, some, in a data analysis performed under this study? So for the first building, you can see the blue circle circling a little bit off center, the first two units, and those two units were both below four, the peak of four peak of periods per liter. But the other five units in that building are all above four. Next building, again, the first two units had no, had, did not have radon above four, but then the, the other three units in the building uh, excuse me, two of the other three units in the building did have radon above four. And so the graph goes, continues. You can see that there are four out of these, four out of these seven buildings. You would miss the high radon if you pick the wrong units when you go to test only 25% of the units in the building. And this is, this next slide is, the overview of that information. What happens? What's the average prob probability of sampling missing a unit in a building above four picocuries? The first column is the number of ground contact units. So the next one's the number of buildings. And then these columns across the top show, they're, they're depicting what happens depending on the amount of units sampled. So this column here, 10% sampling, overall, it, you will you have a 58% chance of missing a high radon unit if you only test 10%. You have a 38% chance if you only test 25%. I know there's a lot of numbers on one graph. Um, I prefer to look at the by that bottom row, which is the average or the summary. Um, but you and you can see that the risk goes down the more you test. But even when you're at 75% testing, you still have a one in 16 chance of missing a high rate on unit in the building. This is the same data, this slide, it's got some larger building um, levels uh, included, but basically it shows the consistency across building sizes, how that probability, where it is at 10% and the slope of the, the numbers as you go down to 90%. So there's consistency across those different types of buildings. 
So here's kind of a quick summary, two data points to think about. Um, and these are from the previous slides as well, that um, if you only test 25% of ground contact units, you have a 38% chance of missing a high radon unit. And if you test half the units, you still have a 19% chance of missing a high radon unit. So the next topic I wanna to turn to is um, staff assistance with device placement and retrieval in just a second. Sorry. As you know, um, there are personnel on site in um, many public housing buildings or, or if they don't, they don't live there, but they work there either every day or they are there several days a week or whatever the schedule is. Um, and it's so important to figure out how to really leverage their knowledge of the residents, their knowledge of the building, and um, include them in the process of testing a building for radon. So here again, I'm quoting directly from our standard. Um, and again, you can look at MAMF online and read this. And, and, and there's also guidance in that standard about how to prepare for having someone come in and test the building and how to work with them and how to work on tenant notifications and so on. But this quote on this slide here is about um, the partnership between the radon professional and the, the individuals on site. Uh, a qualified measurement professional must be physically present during all on-site activities. That's a given. You need that radon professional there at all times when the work is going on. But individuals who aren't qualified in such that way are permitted to assist as long as um, the standard allows them to assist, as long as there's not some prohibition by the, um, the state licensure or other major policy and um, participant names and um, their qualifications or preparations must be retained in the quality control record and made available upon the uh, completion of the work. If non-certified individuals assist in detector placement and retrieval, the qualified measurement professional shall be responsible to either create and present a written work plan specific to apportion tasks and obtain evidence that that plan is understood by all participants, which you know, basically means some kind of on-site training. And, um, and they can also, of course, have uh, individuals who have the skills um, and training uh, completed as well. So someone could be trained, but the point is that it is possible to have your contractors or staff trained by the radon professional. And so here's that same quote again. Um, you just need to look for um, a written work plan that shows that um, that radon professional made sure that the work was understood by all participants. And so um, I just want to do an overview here summarizing you know, what, what's really involved in implementing radon testing in your properties. First of all, um, unit cost. Um, testing per unit can range from $50 to $80 and mitigation can range from $2,500 to $4,000. There's such a thing as collateral mitigation um, where you can basically save some money where one system can serve more than one unit. And this is really specific to the layout of the building that you have and you know the, the specific opportunity to perform collateral mit mitigation is building by building, but I'm told that it can happen quite frequently that you can have those savings, sorry. And then um, routine maintenance, um, you need to be thinking about budgeting $750,000. You're gonna be looking to cover annual inspection, blower replacement every five years, occasional replacement of other components. So then back to what's required by state and what, what do you need to look for when you're hiring? Well, here's again that map, this time it's a Venn diagram. Um, of course, if the state of abbreviation is not on this image, that means it's not a regulated state. So we've got those few in the middle that are both licensed and certified, and we've got certified only, and we've got the licensed only. Um, so steps to take when hiring a licensed state. First of all, find the state radon program. Um, and you can look at that. You, from that URL, you get to the state program. And um, there's lots of things posted on those websites below, besides the list of licensed providers. You may want to read up on um, what their regulations say or what their rule says but they all have um, some point of access to the list of licensed providers in that state. And so you wanna start searching for a professional there. However, if the state requires certification only, you also need to, I mean, requires certification as well. That's a, a mistake in the slide. Um, you, you need to look at the next slide. Um, 
the questions you should ask yourself um, or you should be asking of the professional, does that professional have experience with multifamily? Does, do they have a current state license or registration? Do they, if they're required to have one, have an NRP or NRSB certification? And importantly, you're checking also about which standard will be followed. In a certification only state, um, you're gonna go right to the private proficiency program websites, view the list of certified providers there. And you're asking the similar questions. Do they have an experience in multifamily? Do they have a current NRP or NRSB certification? Do they have a multifamily certificate? And what standard will be followed? Finally, hiring in a non-regulated state, well, it's pretty much the same process. You still wanna look at those same, that same pool of people from NRP or NRSB and ask those same questions. So that concludes my presentation at this time. And um, thank you for your attention. And I wish you the best with your efforts to reduce radon in the complexes that you oversee. Thank you. Well, thanks uh, both Dave and Jane. Um, and there were a few questions that came in through the Q&A and I'll just kind of go through them. And I think um, there's one Dave already answered. So that'll be in the Q&A. And um, so the first one was, when did audible alarms become mandatory? And maybe that's a Dave question. Uh, yeah, in terms of the RFANCI standards, uh, it was January 1st of uh, 2019, where that um, requirement was implemented and actually had a delayed implementation. There was two years to allow manufacturers to uh, actually work on uh, devices that would meet the requirements of that before it was implemented in 2019. But that's part of the RSTANSI standards for the last year and a half. Great. Um, so the second one, I think might also be a Dave question and it's asking about crawl spaces. And um, I think essentially the question was, is the recommendation pouring concrete barrier under the call space? And so if you want to. Yeah, there's no, there is not a requirement um, from a radon perspective that you put a, a concrete barrier. I mean, some jurisdictions put, you know, put a requirement in what's called a rat slab, just an inch of concrete to cover over the soil. Um, but in terms of the standard, what you really uh, is specified is an ASTM membrane, uh, E1745, either a class A, B, or C. That's a little different than just a six mil polypropylene that gets put underneath uh, a concrete. If it's going to be available where someone can crawl in there or they're going to use it for storage, then you want to have a heavier plastic. Uh, so that ASTM standard is called out. Great. Um, yeah, and once again, thanks. That's really great practical information. Um, the next one I think might also be a Dave question, and it's it said the graphics had the piping um, through the building and the roof, and the question was, could it on the outside with an extraction pump be easier? Um, well, that might be the case, okay, but if you're going to replace the extraction pump, it's going to be once every eight or 10 years. Uh, if it's located outside, it's obviously going to be, depending upon where your uh, building is, it may be subject to more uh, damage or vandalism. Uh, and certainly if you're in a cold climate, okay, having exterior piping can actually shorten the, the service life. So really going... When the walls are open, the best thing to do is run the pipe up through the structure and to locate the fan up in the attic. And yeah, you got to fix it once every eight or 10 years. Great, thanks. Um, so the next question, I think might have been on one of Jane's slides, but um, asking why the differences um, in the OMM, OMM retesting two or five years, and it might have been the it might have been the map guide slide. And so what makes the difference between two and five years? So this is actually in the standard, the MAMF standard. And basically you're testing, if you had to mitigate, if you had high rate on level and you mitigated, you need to test every two years. And part of what you're checking is mitigation system effectiveness, right? right. Whereas right. if the test result was below four, the building appears to be safe and clean, um, you really need to test again every five years just to make sure that nothing has shifted either in the conditions in the building or 
you know, other, other factors, something may change in the HVAC. It's important to not just say that that building is safe forever, but at least check every five years. Thanks. Um, and that's actually all the questions. So I, I, which is less than webinar one and two. So I, I like to think we've, we've helped people and they've been good. So, so that makes more of the questions got answered. Although wait, I see one just popped up. So let's see. Um, oh, it's thank you. So, <laughs> so once again, um, that's good news. Uh, if my colleague from Healthy Homes was here, I think he would also mention that that office is designing a uh, demonstration grant right now. So for uh, public housing authorities, stay tuned. This is going to be a $4 million um, grant that they put out a uh, NOFO for, and it'll be specifically for PHAs conducting uh, radon testing and associated mitigation. So that's something to stay tuned. Thanks to everybody for attending. All the registrants are gonna get uh, these presentations uh, by PDF. And as mentioned, we're gonna be uh, putting all three recordings onto a HUD website. So uh, appreciate the attendance and um, thanks to both of the presenters.